stand and turn to number 410 in the Majesty Hymnal, 410. Darla, you're a lifesaver. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take him at his word Just to rest upon his promise Just to know the saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him how I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. On the last, I'm so glad I learned to trust him. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that he is with me, will be with me till the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more brother shane if you would remember charlie while you're opening he had surgery today while you open us in prayer Fills them with encouragement and hope and knowing that they are supported, that they are loved, that they are prayed for, and that we love you and we give you all the credit and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Wow. You, you may be seated. Early on, we saw responses to the gospel from our students. 
We started out with a handful of committed believers, including Margaret, who had prayed and hoped for a church in her area. Her son was among the first four to follow Christ in Baptist. Over time, other adults began following Christ, and a storefront space was regularly filled. Even after sending on a group of believers, starting a new church with missionary Jeff Gross in 2017, we soon needed more space for every facet of ministry. Through the prayers of our church, as well as our supporting friends, God provided a miraculous new building rental for our church. The location is central within our city, and the facilities provide enough space to develop through several phases of growth. We celebrated our first Sunday at the facilities on March 10, 2019. Thai people have come to Christ from so many different walks of life. Many studied the gospel for months before understanding and following Christ. Others, following the witness of their Christian friends, have trusted in Christ almost immediately. February of 2021 saw us place an emphasis on renovating the remaining spaces of our new building, waiting for COVID pandemic regulations to ease up. The generosity of our supporting churches allowed us to renovate strategically for the coming seasons of ministry. Throughout these years, we have partnered with missionaries and national pastors for projects local and long-term, as well as projects for the benefit of churches throughout time. As we look back on this first decade, we see God has formed our foundation for ministry. We've been learning how to communicate in a new language and navigate a new culture. As we get back to ministry in China this fall, our hearts are eager to see God do that which we can only envision through the eyes of faith. We are praying for God to multiply the gospel impact of this young local church. We pray to see God raise up a strong group of leaders and ground them in certain leadership. Our hope is that this church can become a model work and sending force for the strengthening of churches throughout Thailand. After this brief trip, we're going right back to all of our regular ministries. In addition to leading the ladies' ministry and working with teens, Alisa is teaching the fifth grade at a school founded primarily for the education of missionary kids, where our own children attend. I'm excited to teach Bible Institute courses in counseling, discipleship, and the family in this coming year. Our dream is to see God take our day-by-day -day efforts in studying, preaching, teaching, hosting, and evangelizing, and use these routines, infused with the power of the Holy Spirit, to impact this city and the whole of Thailand with the saving power of Jesus Christ. We want to say a big thank you for the prayer and support which enables our ministry. Many of you have partnered with us for a decade now, and we cannot begin to express how thankful we are for you. We continue to dream. We ask God to make himself known to the nearly 70 million people of time. We pray for strength and clarity of vision as we lift high the name of Jesus so many will be drawn to him. And we ask you to continue to stand with us in prayer for our family and for our mission forward so that we might see lives change and be a steady light in this darkness. Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand and turn to number 386. 386. We will again sing the first and the third. I'm just going to leave that off till we're done. Amen. No need that.
right, you may be seated, and we're going to see Diana Rantham. She's from actually right here in our area, and she is now in Papua New Guinea. Amen. So for the, uh, those of you who don't know, Diana is, uh, the video was a little challenging to hear. I hope you could hear a good portion of it. But she is uh, learning the language and the culture so that she can minister or help minister to the unreached peoples there in New Guinea. And yes, there are still places that do not have a gospel witness. And so, you know, that's a, a young lady. She's, uh, I'm going to say, around 30 years of age and uh, left here. As far as I know, she's the only one in her extended family that knows the Lord, and uh, they all think she's lost her mind, but we know she's serving Jesus, amen. So, very excited to support her. Let's stand and turn to number 454, 454, and again, we will sing the first and the last of 454.
I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by His nail-pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords. than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread swing. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords. You may be seated again. You know, the scripture says, out of every tribe, out of every tongue, and out of every kindred. So that means every, every ethnic group in the world, every language in the world, every family in the world will be represented in heaven. Amen. Somebody will come to know Christ out of all of those according to, not according to John, but according to the Word of God. Amen. Amen. And so we, sell, we support uh, Diana there in Papua New Guinea. We support uh, Jonathan Ballou and his family there in Thailand. But we also support Zoli Kish and his family in Hungary. He is from Hungary. Uh, he... Um, uh, well, we're going to let him come with his family and sing, and then he's going to give a testimony, and then I may ask him a question or two afterward. You come on, brother. Oh, 
Thank you so much for having us. We are the Kish family, and I'm glad that Pastor pronounced our name correctly. So it's spelled K-I-S-S, like the Hershey chocolate kiss, but it's pronounced like the French breakfast, Kish. So that's how you remember us from the country of Hungary. So when you're hungry, you can pray for Hungary. So I'm Zoltan, my wife is Johanna, and our 4D family. This is Daniel, Dorka, Domaris, and Dénes. And we are from Hungary, and we speak Hungarian. In fact, the language that we will be speaking in heaven. I told Pastor, because it's so complicated, it's so difficult, it takes an eternity to learn. <laughs> but we grew up speaking that language, and we minister in the country of Hungary, in the city of Budapest, a country of 10 million people, and a city of nearly 2 million people, and many of them without Christ. And God has called us to be there. I didn't... Uh, grew up, well, I, I wasn't born into a Christian family, I was born into a Roman Catholic family, but at a young age of seven, I received Christ as my Savior, and then I witnessed to my father, he also came to church, and uh, then my, my grandmother was also saved, three of us were baptized at the same time, and then uh, I grew up serving the Lord there in southwest Hungary in Pech, and the Lord always worked in my heart to be involved in reaching others with the gospel. First, uh, I studied at the university, uh, probably your favorite subjects, mathematics and physics. And I used to be a scientist, a laser researcher. And then the Lord called me from that to be in the full-time ministry. So nearly 10 years ago, so almost to the day, 10 years ago, we took our first survey trip in the third district of Budapest. There in Ubuda, it's called. And that's the second largest district with more than 120,000 people. And no ch church that preaches the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Back then, 10 years ago, we didn't find any church that would preach the gospel. And the Lord really worked in our hearts. And back then, we didn't have any children. We were just one year married. But the Lord showed us that we needed to move there to start a church. And so I told my pastor and I told him that, We'll, we're going to tell the churches in Hungary, and he said, that's great, but what are you going to do next month? Because you see, there is only a handful of independent Baptist churches, maybe eight in the whole country of Hungary. So then the Lord led us to give an opportunity to churches in Europe to be involved in reaching Europe with the gospel by supporting European missionaries. And one of the first churches that we came was this one. In fact, 
I think the first church in Germany that we shared our calling and our ministry in was this one, and it was a great encouragement on the front end of our deputation that this church took us on on the spot the first time we were here, and that was a great blessing and a great encouragement to us. So we moved to Budapest in 2016 and started a Bible study in 2017, and then, long story short, uh, several people came and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and finally the church was formed six years ago, on the 20th of August, the birthday of our country, our 4th of July is 20th of August, that's where I, our country was founded, and we chose that date for the birthday of our church, so when we chartered, and the Lord has brought several families, and we started Sunday morning services, and then we started midweek Bible study also, and we had several programs uh, in the years. We regularly had uh, Christmas and Easter concerts. We had um, day camps for children in the summer and ladies' meetings and, uh, you name it, all sorts of uh, ministries. Then, of course, with COVID, we had to um, transform to uh, online services for two months. But after that, we could meet. And then the Lord has brought some new people. Our theme this year is rooted and built up in him and we are teaching and preaching through the foundations of the christian life and since january several new people started coming and one of them is liz who's from venezuela but her husband is hungarian and they have two sons she started coming to the church and she told us that she received christ as her savior and she started witnessing to her 15 year old son who first didn't want to hear any of it but a bit later, he, when uh, I talked to him, he told me that he received Christ as his Savior through his mom's uh, testimony. And then they wanted to be baptized in the river Danube. So before that, we had baptisms in, in a pool. But this year, we had a baptismal service in the Danube River. And our son, Daniel, he was also baptized. And it's really great to see Aaron. He already started to witness to his classmates and his friends and brought uh, a few of them to the Lord. And that's a, that's a great blessing. We also have uh, services or ministries like Family Camp, where several churches in the area work together. Uh, my father-in-law is also a pastor, my brother-in-law. So you can say that uh, Independent Baptist Church planning is like a family business in Hungary. Amen. We are all interrelated there. And we work together to have a camp. And we had more than 50 participants, including 20 children under the age of 10. And uh, we want to do something that is extraordinary there, something that is impossible. You know, to plant a church is not just difficult, it's impossible. That's why God has to do it. But Jesus didn't say, I will build your church. He didn't say, you will build my church. But he promised, I will build my church. And so that is what he is doing there in Budapest. And the, the devil is not happy about that. And Pastor mentioned to um, just give a, a brief um, mention of this topic that we were reported based on my preaching I was reported to the child protective services because I preached on the topic of uh, chastening that the, that's the biblical word chastening and um, they you know we had to endure several difficulties because of that someone anonymously um, reported us to the authorities and then they investigated and they came to our home and talked to our children's teachers and doctors and everything. But we, we pray that, that God will take us uh, through that. And finally, they called us that they dropped all charges and we were cleared. And a, a, from every source that they asked, they had good reports about us. So that's a, that's a good uh, feedback for us, a good testimony that the Lord really showed his power through that. And now uh, we are clear of those charges. But all that to say the devil is not happy that we are preaching the gospel there in Hungary. And we want to continue anyway, because we want God to be happy with us. And we started several new programs in the fall. One of them is the Baby Mommy Club. That was really successful before COVID, but then we had to stop in year 2020. But now, as we had a child, Danish was born in February. And so now in the fall, we started this program for young moms with small children. And already we have had several new moms and uh, several new families were represented in that and we share the love of Christ with them and we invite them to church. We also started a group for single ladies, a Bible study. In fact, even tonight at this hour, it's still uh, is just um, on going on right now. 
And we are very happy that two single ladies in our church initiated and started that program. And Aaron, whom I mentioned, uh, he's 16, and he told me that we should have a discussion group for teenagers where we discuss the big questions of life. So he invited his friends and we started that ministry as well. And we want to do something extraordinary, something unusual in Hungary. You know, you can't really homeschool your children, but we don't really want to send them to the public school either, and there are not there aren't any Christian schools. So based on Daniel's um, accomplishments in the piano playing, we uh, had a special permission that he doesn't have to go to all the classes because he has to practice so much. And that way um, he's not so influenced by the, the worldly public school. But please pray for us as we want to continue this. This we have received uh, backlash. You know, we had to kind of fight with the authorities and with the uh, we had to go to court even to appeal this decision to be able to uh, have this special education for him. But please pray as we want to bring up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And we are really thankful for your prayers and your uh, financial support. And our church is Living Water Baptist Church. And Jesus said that uh, whosoever uh, is thirsty, then let him come. It says, I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And he also said, let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. And that's why we named our church Living Water Baptist Church. And please uh, come and see us uh, after the service. We have brought these uh, family pictures. We have also brought uh, prayer cards, but... Uh, we brought the box that had the old prayer card that didn't have all the children, so we quickly ran to DM and printed these uh, family pictures. So we have prayer cards and family pictures. Please pick them up. Again, this is the Kish family from the country of Hungary. And we are really thankful for your participation in our ministry. And may the Lord continue to bless you. All right, so you answered most things, but how old are you, 25? <laughs> I'm 36. 36. So you got saved at seven and you were 10 years ago. So 26, you started, you, the Lord started working in your life about starting a church. Is yes, that right? that's right. Amen. So the Lord was preparing you all these years. And even in the first few years afterwards, the Lord was working and guiding you and shaping you so that you could be a church planter. That's right. The Lord has always worked. Even, even before I was saved, I saw the Lord's hand in that, how he worked in my life. And then as I said, my father got saved and he took us regularly to church. And my mom, she would have none of it for 11 years. We witnessed to her. We invited her to church. And she always said, you'll be the first one. I'll let you know if I'm interested. And after 11 years, I had the privilege of leading her to Christ. And now she's with the Lord. Now she's in heaven. But I'm really glad that uh, my father is still faithful. He's there in church. And I grew up there. I had my first opportunity to preach a very short sermon on New Year's Eve when I was 10. And then I grew up, I played the trumpet in church, we sang in church, I was a youth leader, music leader, and God just gradually um, prepared, little little. prepared me yes, for that ministry. And finally, uh, I was ordained on my birthday when I turned 29. And 20. then, Amen. So ordained at 29. Amen. All right, so last night we heard Fausto uh, give us John 3.16 in Hungarian. I, no, he didn't. In Italian. Yes. How about you give us Romans 10, 13 in Hungarian? So Romans 10, 13 would be Roma 10, 13, mert minden, aki segítségül hívja az Úr nevét, megtartatik. Amen. I'm glad I know what it is in English. Amen. It Amen. might take an eternity. Thank you very much, brother. Yes, thank God you bless so much. You. Thank you. Yes, sir. Now, uh, uh, in a moment, I will call you. So, um, let's stand and turn to number 160. My Jesus, I love thee. Amen. We're going to do the first and the third, but we're still going to do two verses. The first and the third. 160. My Jesus, I love thee. I know. My 
Savior art thou, if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now on the third, I'll love thee in life, I will love thee in death, and praise thee as long as thou lendest me breath, and say when the death you lies cold on my brow. Jesus, tis now. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, Brother Brian's going to come and preach in just a moment, but before he comes, uh, Daniel, who is nine, almost ten, is going to come and play a song for us. try that again. Is anyone here? Good evening. Amen. All right. Okay. My mic wasn't on yet. I think that's what it was. I thought you were ignoring me and I was like, I haven't even started yet. That's terrible. But uh, thank you so much for being here Thursday night of the Missions Conference 2023. I tell you, if my wife and I could start all over again, every time we watch one of these videos and hear a testimony, it makes us want to surrender all over again. Amen. And uh, to see the accomplishments of what God is doing through these people is an encouragement. And honestly, it makes me, I like to be on the winning team. Anybody like to be on the losing team? No. Oh, yeah, I caught, almost got a couple of you. I, yeah, I almost got you. But uh, we like to be on the winning side. But I'll tell you, as a believer, we are on the winning side. 
And so to be involved in what God is doing uh, is exciting. The young lady that was there in um, Papua New Guinea, I'll tell you about three and a half years ago, I think maybe four, uh, we were approached by the Department of Interior from Papua New Guinea uh, from a man who had been saved through the ministry of a BIMI missionary. And he requested that BIMI would put an English King James Bible in the hands of every student in Papua New Guinea. And it was a, a big project. Uh, it was over a million Bibles. And to date, 900,000 of those Bibles have been put into their hands. Uh, the only Bibles that are left to be delivered are the ones way back in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. Very, very difficult to get there. Uh, the man that's in charge of that project, as a matter of fact, is in New Guinea right now and has malaria. So he's down, but they're entrusting the uh, national pastors. It's been amazing. Uh, because of the tribal conflicts of Papua New Guinea, even in the churches, there's always been conflict. But they all got on board with this Bible delivery system, and the, the logistics have been absolutely incredible as these pastors and churches from all over Papua New Guinea have come together. And now think about it. When every child, every school-aged child, will carry a Bible into their home. Now just think about that for a moment. What does the Word of God do? It changes lives. It's going to change a nation. And I do believe, as she said there, talking about the needs for tra and translation work into the native tongues, I tell you, you watch Papua New Guinea for the next several years. I believe God is going to do something miraculous there. And I'm glad to be have had a small part in that. And uh, thank the Lord for that. Now, we're going to take our Bibles tonight. And I'm looking at the clock as well as you. It says 747 up here. Uh, that is, uh, what, 1947? I know some of you have to get up early early in the morning, and uh, but I need at least 25 minutes, okay? Can you give me 25 minutes of your time? And if, I get, if I'm late, trust me, my wife will tell me. She gives me the countdown back there. If you haven't noticed it, she'll give me the five, four, three, two, one. And then she goes, cut it <laughs> off right there. I haven't gotten that signal very often, but I have seen it before. But uh, here's where I want to be tonight. I do not want to shortchange what God is trying to do in our conference. I do believe that God's word is important, and I appreciate so much the testimonies. Appreciate the Keish family, and thank you for explaining how to spell it and how to pronounce it. And when you said the French pastry, I've got it now. And uh, but um, I thank you so much for that and sharing your talents and watching your children. I'm a grandpa now, so watching these young children sing is just a joy to my heart, and I thank the Lord for that. And uh, thank you for making the effort to be here tonight and for serving the Lord. I love your testimony to hear how God's been working in your heart to prepare you for what you're doing now. And I thank God for that. How many of you would say that uh, there's been times in your life when you'd hear a Bible story, maybe a Bible character, um, and you're like, wow, I would love to be like that person. And you kind of play with it in your mind a little bit, and you kind of dream about it. Then you reach that point where you're like, nah, that's not going to happen. There's no way I could be this person. I couldn't be Moses and raise the rod and see the Red Sea. I, I, I understand the man Moses who had a difficulty speaking. I understand that Moses. But the Moses that reached down and picked up the snake's tail and it turned into a rod, that's the guy I don't think I can be like him. Uh, could I be the Apostle Paul? I, oh, I don't know. I mean, you think of what the Apostle Paul went through because of his, his testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. That would be a difficult thing, and it's not really one of the things we would say we aspire to in life. Uh, one of the characters that I heard about as a child growing up in Sunday school and junior church uh, was the Apostle Peter. And I remember Peter from some of the accolades. And we all remember Peter when, you know, he reached out and he cut off the soldier's ear uh, when they came to arrest our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you go, I want to be Peter, not running around cutting off people's ears, but I want to have that kind of a zeal and passion for serving the Lord. And yet you come back to that. Oh, my name is so-and-so, and I'm from this town and that town's not known for anything. And who am I? And I could never be that person. And we shortchange what God is able to do with an individual when he empowers them, as we looked at it last night, his power and his spirit and what he's able to accomplish. 
And tonight I want to really just, I want to look at the Apostle Peter. And I want to go back in time in his life, not from the times of his great miracles and accolades and as the leader of the apostles and and uh, some of the miracles that he was able to perform and all of those things. I want to go back in time and look at Peter's life. And uh, the Bible does give us a clear picture of, of some of his life that helps us to understand it. We're going to start in Luke chapter number five, though, tonight. In Luke chapter number five, we would often refer to, and I probably have referred to uh, this being the beginning of Peter's following the Lord. And yes, that is true. But there were some things that happened in Peter's life before Luke chapter number five that led up to this moment. So let's look at this moment first, and then we'll go back in his life. Luke chapter number five and I've forgotten my glasses, so help me if I, get, if I sound like I'm reading from the wrong Bible. But in Luke chapter number 5, it says, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him uh, to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. This is speaking about the Lord Jesus. He was there by the seashore uh, preaching and teaching. In verse number 2, And he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's. Now, time out here just for a second, because Simon, his full name is Simon Peter. You'll find that through the scripture, and sometimes he's referred to as Simon, later as Peter. So he's sitting here, he said, he entered into a ship, which was Simon's, and prayed him. That means he asked of him that he would thrust out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now, when he had left speaking, verse number four, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets, for a draught. Now, how many of you remember this story where he tells Peter to go out, to launch out, let down your nets? Peter only lets down one net. We call that disobedience, right? And so he was compliant, he was respectful, but in essence, he was disobedient because he didn't do all that the Lord asked him to do. But before this particular event, I want us to go back to uh, John chapter number one. Turn over there with me, and I'm going to have to do this quickly to get the backstory in. John chapter number one. He had a. How many of you? Are, who can tell me who Simon Peter's brother was? Another apostle. Anybody? Andrew, that's exactly right. Well, Andrew, we'll see right here in John chapter number one, was a disciple of John the Baptist, who is the forerunner of Jesus Christ. Andrew, let's look at verse number 27, uh, or 20, yeah, 27. It says, he it is, this is John the Baptist talking about the Lord, who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes the latchet I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Beth Bethbara beyond Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, verse 29, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. So Andrew, uh, there with the, John the Baptist, and the next day John the Baptist told Andrew, this is the man, this is the Messiah, this is who I've been talking about. And Andrew there in John chapter number 1 and verse number 41, he ran, he said, he first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Here is where we find the first personal interaction between the Lord Jesus and and Simon, who later we know as Peter the Apostle. So here in John chapter number one, and this is where I'm going with the message. How did Peter become Peter? It was a long story. And in that long story, you have interactions and you have influences in the life that draws Peter's attention and his focus to a place where when the Lord calls him to do something specific, as he does in Luke chapter number five, Peter is ready to respond to the Lord. So let's look at this. And I often refer to this being from Tennessee. I grew up, I'm a hunter. I love to prepare to go into the woods and, and hunt meat for our family. 
And one of the things you do with your rifle is you take it to the range and you prepare the rifle so that it is an accurate shot. And if you, I know a lot of you guys have been on the range, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. But if it's a new rifle, one that you're unprepared for, or maybe the sight is off a little bit, you take it out and you're satisfied, let's say, if the, the first shot is within a certain target, depending on the distance. But by the time you're finished tuning that, that, that tar, or, uh, what do you call it? Focusing the, there's a word for it. Say it again. Focusing your sight picture. Thank you. That's what I need. For you. you want to finish this message for me? I need that. All right. Yeah, focusing your sight picture. I'm just kidding. Thanks for your help. You want it to be on target. Why? You don't want to waste a shot. You don't want to injure an animal that you can't find later. Well, when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about even in my own life of how I knew some things about the Lord, but it was in the peripheral. It was things like even in Peter's life, Andrew and Peter obviously knew something about the Lord. They knew something about the coming Messiah. So I would call that a third party understanding of someone is coming at some point. But now Andrew, who he grew up with, he's familiar with Andrew. Andrew has literally met the Messiah through the person that he's following, John the Baptist. And he comes home and he says, come meet the Messiah. And now Peter has met the Messiah. And, but that's not the end of it. You, if you go back to Luke chapter number four, we're not going to go into all of this. But you'll see in Luke chapter number four, the Lord Jesus was ministering in the area that Andrew and Peter were living he has gone into the synagogue and he has healed people in the synagogue. After he left the synagogue in verse number 38 of chapter number four, he went into Simon's house and he healed Simon's mother-in-law. Now, I don't know how he felt about that because it was his mother-in-law, but it was a significant event in the context of the Lord Jesus was specifically targeting Simon Peter. Now, when you look at it like this, you'll begin to see that the Lord is really targeting Peter. And it's hard to it's hard to say, no, that's not what's going on, because in chapter number five, we read it already. When he got to the seashore and he's teaching and he's preaching, he turns around and he gets in Simon Peter's boat. He's using it as you would a pulpit or a podium to address the masses that were there on the seashore. It gave him some distance so he could speak to the entire group. But when he had finished speaking, he turned right to Simon Peter and gave him a command. When I see these things in Peter's life, I, I, I look back in my own life and I think about growing up in a home where I heard about Christ. I think about growing up in a church where the Bible was a regular part of my life. And I can remember there being times when people would talk about things of, uh, of peace in your heart, about knowing for sure that you're going to heaven. And even though I had not made a profession of faith, I had heard about it. It was someone else's testimony, but it was sinking into my heart. It was settling into my heart and, and who I was becoming as a person. And the Lord continued to narrow his focus as a, as a rifleman and would on the range to the point where one day he turned directly to me and said, Brian, number one, he said, I want you to be saved the day of my salvation. And so I trusted Christ as my Lord and Savior. Later in life, he visited my heart again because of this interaction. He narrowed his focus again when it was my call to ministry and my call to preach and my call to missions. And I had to come to a place where I was so in tune with what he was asking of me that I was willing to say yes and I want to be obedient you remember last night we concluded the service and I said I want you to to promise me one thing if you'll do this and many of you responded in a positive manner you said how many of you will pray the prayer and just simply say Lord I'm listening well when we listen the Lord begins to speak Oftentimes he is speaking and we're just not hearing because we're so distracted by things in life. But tonight, what I want to do is take this to another step. When you realize the Lord is speaking, there is a response that we should be expected to respond in this manner when God is speaking to us. And we see it here in Luke chapter number five. And I'm, if I sound like I'm rushing, I am because I want to get to the meat of the message and I don't want to leave any of it out. But here's, here's where I want to be in my life. If I want to reach the level of obedience that the Apostle Peter had reached here in the Scriptures, I have to follow this manner. So look at chapter number 5 in Luke again. 
And let's look at the continuation of this story. He said in verse number four, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. We know, we've already spoken about this. He wasn't totally compliant, but at least he was respectful when he called him master. And he did somewhat uh, be obedient to him. Verse number six, and when he had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net brake. And they beckoned unto the partners which were in the other ship that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. What I want you to understand here tonight, and we'll begin to see this in Peter's life, is as the story progresses, Peter is a normal man. Uh, he's studying mathematics and physics like this dear brother Keish here. Peter is a commercial fisherman. He's taking care of his family. There's two ships and two crews involved here. Uh, and think about it. Two ships and two crews, that's more than is necessary to feed one family. This is a livelihood. This is something that he is a specialist in. Now, Peter has appreciated the ministry of the Lord Jesus in other people's lives. He's heard about it. He's seen the impact in Andrew's life. He's had a personal interaction with the Lord Jesus. Others there in Peter's village and in the synagogue that he worshiped in have been touched by the ministry of the Lord Jesus. Peter's mother-in-law has been healed by the Lord Jesus. Why is that significant? Obviously, she was sick enough that the Bible says that he healed her to the extent that she was able to get up and to minister to them. So it was a significant illness recorded in the scripture. All of this has been recorded in Peter's memory. It's been recorded in his mind. He's thinking about it. But now the Lord Jesus is getting very personal. He's on Peter's boat and he's telling Peter how to fish. I don't know about Brother John here, but if somebody steps into my world and my specialty and starts giving me orders and telling me what to do, and it's contrary to expertise that I feel that I have, I'm going to have a little bit of an issue with that. Why is that? Because I feel like I'm an expert in that particular area. That's exactly what Jesus did here in Luke chapter number five. He got on the expert's boat and they had been out all night the night before fishing and had caught nothing. We see that here in just a moment. But I think, and this isn't in the scripture, it's just what I think, because I think God's a little bit sarcastic sometimes with us. I think he sent them right back out to where they had been fishing the night before, where there were no fish. And then when they put down the net, the Lord Jesus just kind of whistled. Remember, he's the creator of all things. He just kind of whistled and brought all the fish back that he had sent on vacation last night. And he brought them back into the net. There were two nets full of fish, but there was only one net down. So he just put them all in it. And he took them down and they began to fill up not only that net, but they filled up that boat and the other boat. And then Peter responded. The first thing he did was he recognized God's pursuit. Now, how do I know that? Look at verse number eight. This is where I really want to focus a couple of minutes. When Simon Peter What's the next two words? Saw it. He had heard about it. He had heard testimony about what Jesus was able to do, but now he's right down in Peter's world in his area of expertise, and he sees that the person that I know not only healed his mother-in-law and cast out the demons in the synagogue and healed the other people and the stories that he's heard, even from John the Baptist, now this man has done something that no fisherman has ever seen before. He simply filled two ships when in the middle of the day when fish don't even come in. Come on. And Peter saw it. And here's what he did. He fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. The first thing that we need to do to reach that level of obedience is simply recognize his pursuit. I want you to understand, at that moment of time, he knew that this man named Jesus, this Messiah, was doing something for him to see. Why is that? Because Peter had been watching, but he had not been seeing. In this moment of time, he saw it, and it impacted him. 
There's, a t there's times in your life as a believer where the Lord will work in your heart and, and, and you'll enjoy the testimony of another person. You'll see a video and you'll think, man, God's called that young lady to Papua New Guinea. And what about the family before the Baloo family that has gone to Thailand and spent a decade there? And you'll be, I mean, you'll be, man, that's a blessing. What an encouragement that is. And then the Lord one day will knock on your heart's door and say, I have something I want you to do. Maybe it's teach a Sunday school class or heaven forbid, sing a special or to play the piano. And suddenly your heart begins to flutter a little bit and you get a little dry in the mouth and, and, and you're a little lightheaded because God's he's, he's, he's stepping in places where he's never stepped before. And he's asking things of you that he's never asked in the, in, before this. And you have a response and that response needs to be, I see God's trying to move me and I need to answer him in a positive manner. So we recognize God's pursuit. Secondly, we obey his commands. What do I mean by that? Understand that he cares that much for you that he would even lead you to do something amazing. A couple of years ago, the Lord put it in my heart to call an individual. And I called this person. I've been trying to lead him to Christ for years. And the timing of the Lord is always the most, most important. I'd been praying for this man. I'd been witnessing to this man as much as he would allow this day, the Lord said, call him. I picked up my phone. I called him. He didn't answer. So I left him a voicemail and I said, Stan, I said, this is Brian. And I just wanted to let you know, God loves you. And so do I. I hung up the phone. Why did I say that? I have no idea. The Lord told me to say it. I'd like to believe that. And I think you'll believe it as well in a moment. But I hung up and I said, well, I've done what God asked me to do. And then the Lord said, text him. And I texted this man named Stan. I said, Stan, God loves you, and so do I. End of text. No reply, no answer. I went on down the road. I was going to see my granddaughter, who was three at the time. And I have my granddaughter on my knee, and I'm playing with her. And she calls me Papa, and the whole world just stops and doesn't matter anymore when she's in my lap because I'm Papa. And she says, Papa, I love you. And I'm like, oh, what do you want? What kind of car? What color? I mean, I'll just go ahead and buy it. I know, I know you're five now, but we'll just get it on order and make sure it's ready for you. But while she's bouncing on my leg, my phone rings. And I saw the phone. It said, Stan. And I said, well, he's calling me back. No, no big deal. So I, I answered the phone, and Stan was stammering and stuttering in his speech. And I thought maybe he was inebriated, but I soon found out he wasn't. He was getting his composure and he said this, he said, do you know where I am? I said, I have no idea. He said, do you know where I was when you called me? I said, I have no idea, Stan. He said, I was taking my own life. He said, I literally was hanging from a rope in my bathroom and the hook fell out of the wall and I landed on the floor and his girlfriend heard him hit the floor and she came in. She was a nurse. She resuscitated him. He picked up his phone and the first thing he saw was a text saying, Stan, God loves you and so do I. He said, what do you mean God loves me? Man, I've been trying to talk to Stan for years. But in that moment of time when God had him, I'm not saying God put a rope around his neck. That's not what I'm saying at all. When Stan was at his lowest and he needed help, he recognized that God had spared him. And suddenly he wanted to come to know God. Stan got saved through that. Now I think about this particular thing and I think about my obedience to his commands that my obedience needs to be in a timely manner because the work of God matters. It counts. The timeliness. I need to be where he wants me to be when he wants me to be there. Right. Peter learned that in his own life, in his own ministry. He needed to be exactly where God needed him at the right time. And he learned to be obedient to that level. So we recognize his pursuit. We're obedient to his commands. And then I want to give you one other thought. And that is resting in that that he will be glorified through your obedience. Now look at this just for a moment. Go back to chapter number five and we'll be done here in just a moment. I know that means nothing when a Baptist preacher says it, but that is my intent, okay? That is my heart. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes that they had taken. And then verse number 10, it talks about who was with him. And in verse number 11, And when they had brought all their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Bear with me here just for a second. Think about this. What had they been doing all night the night before? Fishing. Fishing. 
it's safe to say and to reason that they were looking for fish. Now they have more fish than they could have caught in a week. But what did it say they happened in verse number 11? And when they had brought their ships to land, they filleted fish all afternoon. You know what happens when you follow the Lord and you see him do a miracle in your life? Nothing else matters anymore. They forsook all. In other words, that means they walked away from two ship full of fish on the edge of the water and they followed Jesus. It tells us in another gospel that he said, I will make you fishers of men. And that's exactly what he did. At that moment in Peter's life, fish didn't matter. You say, well, how is he going to feed his family? He didn't care because he had had a glimpse of what the God of heaven was wanting to do through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wanted to be a part of it. And he was calling Peter to be a part of it. And Peter's like, I'm all in. Let's go. Someone else can have the fish. Come on. When the point of this message is recognizing the pursuit of God in our own lives. Like Brother Keese was sharing earlier in his testimony, he was growing up in church and he was pursuing other things in a career and his studies. And then the Lord finally narrowed his focus on his life and said, I want you to be a preacher. And it was only one thing he could do at that point, And that was to say, yes, Lord, I will be a preacher of the gospel. He didn't know what's coming ahead of that. He just simply knows there's nothing in his life more important than following God and being a preacher of the word. Here's the thing. As you're obedient to that command, or as you recognize his pursuit, you step out in obedience and say, Lord, I don't know what all this means. I'm just a fisherman with a mother-in-law that was healed last night. I don't know what's coming down the road. He didn't talk to him about the rooster that would crow. He didn't talk to him about the guards in the Garden of Gethsemane. He didn't tell him about the Mount of Transfiguration. He didn't tell him about all of those things. He just simply said, I want you to follow me, and I'm going to show you something like you've never seen before. And he was obedient to his commands. And then, as I mentioned lastly, he rested in knowing that he would be, or God would get the glory through our obedience. What do I mean by that? When you know you're following God, you lay your head down on the pillow, and all of us have lists that we want to see done every day. And I like for the list to be done when I lay my head down on the pillow. Sometimes I'm too tired to even care, but in my heart, I want that list to be done. But now, when you're following the Lord, the lawn might not be mowed because the Lord called you to a neighbor's house to help them with something so that you could be a witness. It may be that some other thing that you wanted to get done have to, will have to wait till another day because something that Jesus really needed done had to be done that day and you were obedient to him and that's all that matters. Amen. I say all this to you because I believe that the Lord calls a lot of people to do things in their life and they're too busy to even hear him. Mm. I believe that the Lord will speak to people in their life and ask things of them and they're like... I don't think I can do that. And they don't recognize the power of God and what he's able to do for you. Moses didn't think he'd be able to speak. David was just a lad. How could he be a king? When I think about the apostles and who they were, you know, Luke the physician and others as uh, the publican, uh, the tax collector, how can they possibly be someone that could bring folks and influence folks for Christ? It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your pedigree. It doesn't matter your education. It simply matters that you're obedient to the Lord because he's going to call you to do something that he's willing to do through you if you just make yourself available. Amen. The statement here is this. Is God pursuing you? And if he is, last night we said, Lord, I'm listening. Tonight we say, Lord, would you give me courage? I hear you. I don't know what this means, but I hear you speaking to me. Lord, give me the courage to say yes. I don't know what God's speaking to your heart about tonight. It could be about writing a book. It could be about where you're going to college. It could be about the call to preach. It could be the Lord's really been working in your heart about your salvation. But tonight you realize he's been working in your heart this whole time. And tonight you're like, hey, this is he's speaking to me and I want to respond. Amen. I would love to see more people surrender to missions and surrender to preach and more military missionaries. That's my heartbeat. We need more. What is God asking you to do? Would you say, yes, Lord? And would you forsake all and follow him? Let's pray.
Our Father, we come to you tonight, and Lord, I really do appreciate these families uh, that have come out on a Thursday night. Lord, I know I've gone a little bit later than what I wanted to go, but Lord, I believe you are speaking to someone specifically tonight because this is the message that you put on my heart. Lord, there may be someone here tonight that's right at that point of decision. And Lord, they're, they're willing, but they don't know how to say yes, or maybe they're holding back because they're unsure of what that yes will bring in their life. But Lord, take them to that next step where Peter was willing to forsake all and follow Christ. Lord, I pray that you would work in hearts tonight as you have before, and we'll give you the praise and the honor and glory for it. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, many of you indicated last night that you would say, Lord, I'm listening. How many of you would say tonight that God is definitely speaking to your heart about something? And tonight you'd say, Brother Brian, I want you to pray for me. I can hear the Lord's voice. I know He's dealing with me, but I want clarity. And right now I just need courage to be obedient. Here's my hand anywhere in the auditorium. I need the Lord to be clear and I need courage. I see your hands all over the auditorium. Thank you for your honesty and your transparency. I didn't say that to embarrass you. You can put your hands down. I want to pray for you, and we will certainly do that. How many of you would say, I relate to Peter? I'm just an average guy trying to feed my family. I'm just a, a mom that takes care of the family, stays home. I don't know what I'm capable of doing, but if God wants to use me, I want to be available to him. Here's my hand. Would you pray for me, Brother Brian? Anywhere on the auditorium, I see your hands. Then I encourage you in just a moment. She's going to begin playing softly, and you can go ahead and begin. Let's stand to our feet, our head bowed, and our eyes closed. Maybe you don't want to go home until you've spent a few moments in prayer. Why don't you come? Right now, the invitation is open. If you'd like to come, why don't you come right now? If the Lord's speaking to your heart. Someone else. Others are coming. What about you? I'm not asking you to come for my sake. I'm asking you to come for your sake. I want you to talk to the Lord. Tell Him, I'm not only listening, but I'm hearing and I'm praying for courage to be obedient. Anyone else? Anyone else?